Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the Masters of Educational Technology at UBC's first ever speaker series on anti-racism in the ed technosphere. My name is Dr. Carrie Ewart and I am a lecturer for the Masters of Educational Technology program and what we call MET at UBC. I'm one of the designers and coordinators for the Anti-Racism in Ethno -techno Technosphere Speaker Series, along with director of the MET program and colleague, Dr. Samia Khan, whom you just met. I would now like to invite Dr. Dr. Khan to share with us our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Dr. Ewert. As part of the broader National Truth and Reconciliation effort in Canada, and at UBC, and as a reckoning of our colonial past and colonial present. We begin meetings from UBC with land acknowledgements. Indigenous peoples have practiced these land acknowledgements for millennia. I would like to acknowledge that the UBC Point Grey campus, on which the Master of Educational Technology program is run, is on the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territories of the Musqueam people. We recognize the sustained oppression, land dispossession, and involuntary removals of the Musqueam nation from these lands from which we benefit from. Colonialism is the current social structure in our societies. Indigenous nations who have been sovereign over this land continue to face issues of land dispossession and the ramifications of residential schooling today. As people who work at the intersection of education and technology, we must recognize the role that our social institutions and educational technologies continue to play in racism. The Master of Educational Technology or MEP program in the Faculty of Education at UBC educates professionals on the use and impact of digital learning technologies. This fully online graduate program provides a unique opportunity for graduate students to engage in topics such as the role of digital technologies in anti-racist education. MET dedicates itself to reconciliation by supporting its learners, stakeholders, and the public to make a positive change in their communities. This series, a first of its kind for us, aims to contribute to this goal. Now, the purpose of the of the speaker series is to Now, the purpose of the speaker series is to acknowledge the commitment that every individual has to inclusivity and to addressing systemic racism with a focus on anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, and anti-people of color racism. And this series seeks to identify the responsibility that educators and leaders have to facilitating and supporting anti-racist approaches and strategies within their practice to enhance and transform learning environments and learning cultures with a specific directive being digital technologies. Presenters will discuss racism and tools to support equity, diversity, inclusion, and changing dynamics of the digital age. Now, as a result of this, as MET, we are committed to following up with each presentation of the speaker series with a call to action challenge. We invite attendees to make one change this month and to share it with us as a next step to these presentations to eradicate racism through community building, education, and through the use of educational technologies. This call to action provides you the opportunity as attendees of the speaker series to build on the anti-racist content from the presentation and steps for making change. For example, you might integrate what you've learned or heard or thought about from this session through a lesson plan that brings awareness to the issues of racism for students, colleagues, and friends. We will provide you with more details about the call for action and call for proposals at the end of the session. We would like to thank the Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center for their generous support of our anti-racism series and our special call to action. Anti-Asian racism is being experienced around the world and within Canada, NBC. According to a COVID racism project of the Chinese Canadian Council, funded by the Government of Canada, in the first five months of 2021 alone, there were over 50% more incidents of anti-Asian racism reported than all of 2020. Vancouver also has the highest number of reported incidences per capita in the country. We know that racism is not captured within physical boundaries alone, 
with digital technologies playing a role in racism and social justice. At this time, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to today's speaker. We welcome Dr. Carrie Wu, an assistant professor of sociology from York University in Toronto, Ontario. Dr. Wu's research focuses on anti-Asian racism, inequality, immigration, and political culture, and he has been featured on many national and international media platforms, including CBC, NPR, CTV, The Washington Post, The Toronto Star, McLean's Magazine, and The Economist. His recent focus addresses the rise of anti-Asian racism during the COVID-19 pandemic and highlights the impact it has had on Asian communities. Welcome, Dr. Wu. Thank you, Kerry, for the uh, kind introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this afternoon. I'm happy to be here. Um, so for today, I'm going to talk about anti-Asian racism, uh, my recent research, and also three Three things I'm going, going to talk about. First is like, uh, why are we here? And then the second thing I'm going to talk about is the um, what I have done like uh, over the last couple of years. Like we are in pandemic for more than almost two years. What have I, what have I done during that uh, time period, especially in the uh, case the rights of anti Asian racism. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about my suggestion, comments about what education or educators can do uh, in kind of like fighting anti-Asian racism. So why are we here? We're here because just this past Saturday, Asian and Asian women in New York were pushed to a desk to in front of like in the subway, right? And then we are here is during the New Year Eve in Vancouver, this Asian women were attacked for no reason. And we are here because since the pandemic started, there were huge rise in anti-Asian racism, anti-Asian hate crime, right? So for example, this is another picture showing that this Asian woman were randomly punched in the face at the bus station in Vancouver. And then the organizations, Chinese Toronto organization, they have been collecting here in Canada, the incidents over since the pandemic started. And then they have been collecting over thousands of hate crimes, targeting Asian Canadians. And in the United States, the stop AAPI organizations, they have come together and have been collecting more than 10,000 cases, anti-Asian hate crimes, right? So those are just numbers, but I, what I'm gonna, and you probably have already heard about those numbers, but what I want to talk about two important points, maybe you have never heard about is first is that the anti-Asian racism is much more widespread than we think. Second thing is like, we have very little knowledge and the awareness, I mean the public, about the anti-Asian racism. So thinking about why anti-Asian racism is more widespread than we think. So from the survey data, I'm a survey researcher, Survey data often ask, have you ever, for example, asking Asian Canadians, have you ever experienced personally anti-Asian racism during the pandemic? A lot of data shows that here in Canada, more than half Asian Canadian reported that they directly, personally experienced anti-Asian racism during the, since the pandemic started. And in the United States, 
what a lot a lot of surveys show very similar patterns. So here is a question for you. What's the popul Asian population in Canada? How big do you think Asian Canadians? How many Asian Canadians we have in Canada? The answer is almost one in five Canadians identify themselves as Asians. One in five Canadians, almost 20% of Asian population, uh, Canadian populations are Asians, right? In the United States, only about 6% of uh, US population. Here we have 20% of Canadian population are Asians, identify themselves as Asians. So if we, if from the survey data, we're thinking about almost half saying that they directly experienced anti-Asian racism that lead to millions, millions of Asian Canadians personally experienced anti-Asian racism during the pandemic, since the pandemic started, right? So that's how widespread the anti-Asian racism is in Canada here, right? But we also need to think about those people who indirectly experienced anti-Asian racism. Think about parents, like worry about their children in school, right? And then think about us, like we, we worry about our parents on the street because if they go on, they are likely to be targeted, right? So everyone could be worried. And in fact, I've been talking to many Asians they worry about their parents. They worry about their children, right? And then for me personally, I'm when every time when I see news through Twitter, media, when I see people got Asian Canadians, Asian Americans, Asians got talked, it, right? That affect me personally. I can't sleep, right? I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about what's going on. And then this really affect me personally, even I have never directly experienced anti-Asian racism. But those numbers, those videos make me sad. I'm sure make a lot of people sad, Asians. And then also international students, for example, they worry their parents back in China, Japan, Korea, they worry about their safety here outside of their home country, for example, right? So think about that anti-Asian racism is much, much more widespread than we think. So that's the first point. And the second point is that we, uh, about the widespread anti-Asian racism, the other thing I want to talk about is our equal impact, right? So we talk about parents worry about their children, and then we think about those media Incidents, a lot of like more vulnerable people, women, elders, children, those people who are often powerless. And then when they targeted, those cases often go underreported because those, for example, the organizations, the numbers we see, they of, those are often people go self-report through the website, right? We wouldn't expect, for example, when elders got attacked, they would go online and report the cases. So that's the other reason why the um, anti-Asian racism is more widespread than we think, unequal impact. And the children, right? So from the survey data, younger people, children, are much, much more likely to report directly experience anti-Asian racism in school, right? Here in Canada, also in the United States. For example, this UBC data, I think UBC, they collaborate with uh, Anx Reed survey. They reported almost 60, 58% of Canadian youth reported personally or seeing others uh, being attacked during the pandemic, since the pandemic started. And then the president, Santa Ono, was talking to the media saying that no, I agree that not child, not no child should be ever experienced bullying in school and, and on the street. And then in Vancouver and in Toronto, think about the Asian children, the numbers. 47%, for example, here in, 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 in Toronto, the Toronto School Board reported 47 uh, Asian children identified as Asian. 
So almost half of children in school in big cities now are Asians, right? If they suffer from experiencing of bullying or negative experience, discrimination, then they can suffer. And then how big is the population? You can, you can think about the, 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 the infant. The second one I want to go into is we know very little about anti-Asian racism or be aware of, I mean, the general public. So think a little bit about what is anti-Asian racism? When we, we talk a lot about, okay, anti-Asian racism, what is anti-Asian racism? Think for 30 seconds, what is anti-Asian racism? I searched Google, the, the, the Canada's anti-racism strategy last year, they have the anti-Asian, anti-racism strategy for 2019 and 2022. They did, the, the document did not mention anti-Asian racism at all. Anti-Asian violence, there's no mention about anti-Asian racism, anti-Asian violence. So the, I, I wrote a group of uh, 15 Canadian scholars and we wrote about this uh, last year in April, right? And then after that, I think they, now if you look at the Canadian anti-racism strategy, they included anti-Asian racism, the terminology and definition, right? And the, here is the, when we think about what is racism, I just Google about racism and here is the, um, Racism is discrimination directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, or the belief that different races have different ability, characteristic qualities, right? So this is just Google definition. But if we take, if we take a look at this is Canadian government definition, Anti-Asian racism is discrimination experienced by Asian people. So you think about the differences. Injustice, discrimination experienced by Asian people. And then Asian, anti-Asian racism is Asian people's perception of being, for example, model minority, right? So do you see any problems with this kind of definition, right? Here, if we do a Google search, very simple, racism is a discrimination directed against people from particular racial group, right? And here is Canadian government definition is Anti-Asian racism is discrimination experienced by Asian people, right? So this is, you can still find those definition online. And this definition is a new definition. It's ad, it was added just a few months ago, right? So do you think there's any issue? What do, I, do you agree with this kind of definition? What is anti-Asian racism, right? Dr. Henry Yu from UPC, a historian, he very clearly pointed out that what's going on with this kind of definition, racism in general, or anti-Asian racism, right? So those type of definition, so you see subtly switching the focus from the cause to the effect, right? So when we think about the sexual assault of women, we try to understand and then define the sexual, Assault of women from the women's perspective, thinking about the, the effects on women, but not thinking about people who are attacking women, right? So the similar is that when we think about anti-Asian racism, we're talking about discrimination experienced by Asian people, but we're not talking about people who are racist, who are doing those actions, right? So in general, we would need to think about the anti 
racism in general, not just anti-Asian, racism, anti-Black racism, all those racism in general have nothing to do with kind of racialized people, race, right? So think about this anti-Asian racism in Canada, in the United States, but there are a lot, a lot of Asian people in Japan, but we don't see anti, we see very little anti-Asian racism in Japan, right? So from this kind of perspective, perspective we think about anti-Asian racism might not be about Asian people, right? And it's very, very important to think about anti-Asian racism from, not from the effect, but from the cause, from the cause, not the effect, very, very important, right? So what is the elephant in the room, right? So this is a question asked by Henry, Dr. Henry Yu, right? So when we think about anti-Asian racism, what is the cause, right? We, like I said, we should not thinking about the effect, right? People experience anti-Asian racism is not those discrimination experienced by Asian people, but something that lead to those kind of experience, right? We should focus on the course. Henry said, is white supremacy. This is the course for all forms of racism, not just anti-Asian racism. And then Asian Canadian, because when we think about we are Asians, right? We have very little control over, over identity, right? Be because we are labeled as Asians. We are seen as Asians. So that's the reason that why, for example, that, that last year there was a case that the indigenous First Nation people were, got, were attacked because she looks like a, a Chinese. First Nation people looks like the Chinese, so she got attacked too because she was labeled or seen or interpreted, understood as Asian, right? So, but being Asian, we have no control for over identity here, right? We are labeled as racial minorities. We are labeled, labeled, we are raised, right? So what we have to think about, instead of thinking about the rules of anti-Asian racism, we should think about the rules of Canadians' white supremacy. Where did it come from, right? So why, for example, who belongs in Canada? Who defined that kind of like right, right? And then who is deserving wealth and comfort here in Canada? And who owns the land we live on, right? So those are from Dr. Henry E. So don't, if we think about this, and then we think about those rules of white supremacy, I'm gonna talk about a few. One is historical and today, right? So think about those who defines Canada as white man's country, right? So for example, Chinese, they migrate, many, many Chinese migrate to Canada, United States, even before Canada become a nation, right? But there's a lot, a lot of policy denied citizenship for Chinese. And there's a lot, a lot of cases denied, not just Chinese, people from all Asian countries, right? And then during, for example, between 90, 1895 to 1950, there were more than 175 anti-Asian laws, policies, laws in Canada, right? And it's still today, when we think about today, right? So think about the immigration policy, thinking about those immigration programs, it's still, for example, the immigration insensitive or point system, we're trying to select Canada as a country, we're trying to select good immigrants, people who are rich, rich Asians from Asian countries to as a model minority, as a good immigrant, right? And then we also have those live-in caregiver program, kind of like special or like working program 
special kind of immigration program to invite people from Asia or from other countries to work here locally, do the hard work to do the um, attractive work. And then when they came here, even they want to change job, it's difficult for, for example, care workers, it's difficult for them because they are doing care worker here, then they have to do care workers for their life. It's difficult for them to change jobs. It's difficult even for them to gain citizenship, right? So those kind of immigration policy is also part of anti-Asian racism, right? So this is historically, and then today we have those kind of laws and policy. And it's also a political issue. Right. So, for example, if you look at this interview happened last year, Justin Trudeau answered the question was about addressing the root cause of anti-Asian racism. He blamed China. Right? It's China, 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 China. It's China's fault. And then there's also racial profiling. Right, thinking about racial profiling, let's think about racial to understand racial profiling is think about United States, think about police and then black people, right? African American, they are much, much more likely to be stopped, for example, for and then they are much, much more likely to be uh, arrested. And then so that's what we call racial profiling, right? And then since the pandemic started, then in 2018, actually, before the pandemic started, this uh, China initiative, right, targeting, for example, Chinese scientists in universities, investigate them. And then uh, just this has just happened today, for example, a, a top uh, MIT researcher, scientist, that was facing a lot of charges, but today, uh, all the charges uh, against Dr. Uh, this MIT professor, Dr. Gong Chen, were, were dropped, just happened today. And in the many other cases, many, many during after the China initiative was enacted in 2018, the many, many, many Chinese professors in on campus were investigated. And the most uh, flawed investigation. So think about that, right? So they, it's very similar to Black Americans are much more likely to be targeted, to be arrested, and then even more likely to be stopped while driving on the street, right? For no reason. So that's what we call racial profiling. And then science published articles thinking about like when the system is doing this, majority of Chinese professors or Asian professors, they feel uncertain, right? They will have higher, they have to experience the stress, anxiety, right? It's really damage their well-being, their health, mental health, right? And then in, in Canada, we like very much follow the US policy, especially China policy, right? The US China uh, relationship and Canada China relationship and we very much are likely to follow those kind of US policy. For example, this is just uh, last year, right? This political orders ban university campuses and professors to collaborate with, for example, Chinese organizations, Chinese professors, right? And they are more likely to uh, investigate, of course, here. Uh, I, I'm sure many Asian uh, Canadian professors were also suffer from those kind of like policy, have to worry, have to uh, experience anxiety because of those kind of racial profiling policies. It's also social, right? In Canada, we often say, okay, Canadians are very kind. We don't have any racism here, not anymore, right? politically or uh, socially, right? So like, we don't see racism. So those, is if we do not acknowledge this racism, then we are not aware, right? And people not educated about 
the racism, not just anti-Asian racism, but for forms of racism. Right? And in particular, when we think about Asians, right? Asians were stigmatized as like carrying disease, right? And the Asians uh, were labeled as model minority, right? So what's, what's the problem of being labeled as model minority? Right? So model minority is, uh, is a concept used in, by a sociologist back in 1960s, right? And then the sociologist described Japanese American as model minority, arguing that, see, the immigrants or racialized American, they can achieve the success through hard work, right? So for example, and then they ac accuse that other minorities are not hardworking enough to achieve success. So it's their personal problem, not the systemic problem, right? And then when Asians in the United States and in Canada as, were labeled as a model minority, then for example, it's difficult for, for example, Asian students getting into schools at the same uh, qualities. It's difficult for Asian students, for, for example, getting into Harvard, even though they are qualified, right? Because they deem us higher standard unequal standard. So that's the lead to the systemic institutional bias, institutional discrimination. Right? So those are all the kind of the rules. It's the rules for anti-Asian racism is rules for protecting kind of like white supremacy, right? Instead of instead of the effect of but though all those laws, social, political fires create damaging effect on um, Asian communities here in Canada and also in the United States. So that's the first part of thinking about uh, what anti-Asian racism is more widespread than we think. And it also like we really, as the public, Canadians have little knowledge about what is anti-Asian racism, how to understand anti-Asian racism and the, the, the impact. And the second part I'm gonna talk about is what have a dam during the pandemic in terms of researching the rise of anti-Asian racism. Three things I research about the mental health impact of people's experience anti-Asian racism or the, just the rise of anti-Asian racism in general. And second, I also research how Asians is not Chinese, Japanese, just but from diverse backgrounds how Asians could experience anti-Asian racism differently. And then finally, I will talk a little bit about like how children, especially when they experience anti-Asian racism, how that could lead to long-term impact on, on their well-being, on their uh, achieve, academic achievement, and then their life course consequences. So, Mental health impact. I mentioned a little bit about the indirect impact of anti-Asian racism, but here is more direct impact. Right? So in the United States, this University of Southern California, they have been collecting very good data. They follow, since the pandemic started, they've been following more than 800 um, Asian Americans. So every two weeks, they ask about their experience, their mental uh, health conditions and all that. So here is a visualization. So first uh, panel, look at the experience of anti, uh, experience of discrimination. You see uh, the, the number one is just a month before the pandemic started. And then I separate between three categories, white, Americans, Asian Americans, and uh, Asian immigrants. So Asian Americans, Asian immigrants, foreigner born Asians, uh, and uh, native born Asian Americans. And then you see this huge rise in terms of their experience of anti-Asian racism, especially among Asian Americans. After the pandemic started, there's a huge 
rise in terms of their experience of anti-aging racism. And then you, the second panel, look at their mental health conditions, right? Mental health disorders. They're highly correlated. And this is panel data. So it really demonstrates the cause of the and effect. Panel data mean, meaning that following the same individual over time, right? So it's not every wave is not different group of people, but for example, asking Carrie Wu every two weeks following their experience and then their mental health condition. So those kind of data, longitudinal data provide strong evidence um, for the, the, the cause, co causality between the uh, causal effect of experience of racism and their mental health um, disorders, right? And in Canada, uh, we also have uh, some data, but not panel data, but the pattern is very similar. Like Asian Canadians, when they experience racism or report or seeing others experiencing racism, their mental disorders, conditions much, much worse or poorer, they have experienced poorer mental uh, conditions. Right? So that's how kind of like racism in general can affect people's health, right? Racism health. Second point I wanna talk about that, how the Asians from different backgrounds experience anti-Asian racism differently. Right? It's very important. It's similar to the model minority concept. We cannot group all Asians together, right? Asians, very diverse. Right? We, there are people who are more successful than others and their Asians experience hardship, difficulties. So it's, it's very important uh, to not to treat Asians as one single group, right? So that's the reason why, for example, we cannot say, okay, every Asian is, um, has to be kind of like higher standard in terms of getting into Harvard, even they are very qualified, right? So it's important to not treat all the Asians as model minority, right? So, so that's why it's important to also think about how Asians experience racism differently. And I wanna talk about two things. One is individual level, how individual factors, backgrounds could um, affect how they experience differently. Another is the contextual uh, factor. So, at the individual level, one key factor that could lead to differential experience is citizenship, is whether Asians are native born or foreigner born, right? We would, we would assume that people who were foreign, foreigner born, immigrants would more likely to report higher racism here in Canada or in the United States, right? Because they, they, they have fewer friends, they are more likely to suffer from like lack of support because for example, they're new here, right? So we would assume that's the case, but from the data, it shows the opposite pattern. All the surveys data shows that native born Asian Canadians and native born Asian Americans are much, much more likely to report or perceive discrimination than foreigner born Asians. So, there are a lot of, lot of uh, explanations. One ex explanation could be uh, native born are uh, more sensitive to discrimination. And then also the other mechanism I'm talking here is like more like a native born Americans, Canadians, they are more knowledgeable about or more aware about um, racism. So those racial consciousness, if we think about the racial consciousness, consciousness, they are more likely to identify them as Asians because we, they, Asian Canadians, Asian Americans labeled as Asian through school, through growing up. But if Asian immigrants, they have lower race consciousness and that could lead to lower sensitive to discrimination, right? If locally born, native born Asian Americans, Asian Canadians, they have higher race consciousness. Race consciousness means they're strongly, more strongly identify themselves as belonging to Asian ethnic groups. And then when they see people experience 
anti-Asian racism, or they themselves personally experienced racism, the damage effect is greater, right? So that's one mechanism could lead to the differential experience between native born and foreigner born. And the second uh, factor that could create differential experience at contextual level is how many Asians in the place Asian Canadians live. For example, when we think about this news report uh, labeled Vancouver as anti-Asian racism capital, right? So, but when we think about like, when there's more Asians or there's fewer Asians, how that co-ethnic concentration affect Asian people's experience. Right? In general, over analysis of the data shows a curved linear pattern. Meaning that when there's very few Asians, for example, in maybe in Halifax, there's fewer Asians. And then in BC, there's more Asians. And then there's in the middle, maybe uh, in some other cities, Calgary, maybe in the middle, right? So the pattern is that in Halifax, Asian people experience lower racism. But in BC, they also experience lower levels of racism, but the perception or experience of racism is the highest among the, the boundary area. Not, not too many Asians, not few, like in terms of numbers, right? So the, this curve uh, linear relationship. And then the mechanism we are arguing is that be, because when there's a fewer Asians, maybe the direct contact between, for example, Asians, white and other groups, uh, people from other racial groups, there's a fewer contacts and there's fewer opportunities, interactions, and that could lead to a uh, fewer perception or fewer uh, direct experience of anti-Asian racism, racism, right? And then when there's a lot, a lot of Asians, then Asians are more likely to feel like uh, safer or they have stronger like sense of belonging because of the, the, they perceive more support and they could also experience or report or perceive lower, right? So the perception or experience racism, it, the level is highest among in the middle places, middle concentration of Asian people. For example, in the United States, we would assume California people, Asians from California, they will report lower anti-Asian racism than people from Chicago, right? Well, there's middle ground, right? But people from Montana, maybe they also Asian from Montana, they ex experience lower anti-Asian racism too. So there this uh, curve linear association, thinking about how contextual level factors could shape Asians experience of anti-Asian racism differently. And finally, we need to think about the unequal impact of anti-Asian racism, especially thinking about children. When children experience anti-Asian racism or discrimination at school or on the street, the impact is much, much greater than, for example, an adult Canadians, adult Asian Canadians. The idea is that when children experience bullying, for example, bullying or negative experience in general, not just discrimination, just negative experience in general, this kind of experience have long lasting impact on their mental health and on their views toward others and their views toward people, society, the world in general. One long-standing research I've been doing is I study trust, trust the relationship, how people trust in others. Do you trust in others, right? And then in the United States, for example, uh, when this gun violence is widespread and when people experience gun violence, they have much, much lower trust in others. But this negative effect of gun violence on people's trust is, greater when the gun victimization is the 
the time life course is among early in life, the childhood. The childhood gun victimization has much, much, much stronger impact on people's trust views later in life. Right? So, for example, in the in, in the United States, American African Americans have much, much higher odds of experiencing um, gun violence. And their trust is much, much lower. And especially among those African Americans who experienced gun violence early in life, the damaging effect is much, much stronger. So those kind of research, what those kind of research suggests that early life socialization is key to understanding how kind of like racism affect people in general. So that's why education comes in, why education is so important in terms of shaping their views toward others and then also their racial relationship, right? So the third part I'm going to talk about is how education and educators can help in terms of fighting racism, anti-Asian racism, or all forms of racism in general. And I'm going to talk about three things. One is, first important thing is just be aware and consider it, right? Be aware means that be a, acknowledge the racist, racism, discrimination in school, right? And then be considerate means, meaning that you need to take into account racial trauma, right? So people, their ex experience of um, racism. When we're talking about uh, racism. And, and the second point I'm talking about curriculum, anti-racist education, how we can do um, kind of like uh, achieve anti-racist education. And finally, I'll talk about how technology, new technologies that can help really help us achieving anti-racist education. So first things, acknowledge that education is not race neutral. Right? So when we think about racism, it's not just people to people. Right? It's not just maybe teachers to students. And it's also very important to think about it's not just those explicit, but also implicit bias, implicit racial discrimination. Right? And then also think about racism can happen at institutional level. And then, in fact, the, the, the main racism happens at systemic institutional level, right? People to people racism is a small part of the big problems, right? And then finally, we also to think about that educational segregation, right? Inequality, right? So when we teach via Zoom, for example, a lot, of, a lot of minority populations here in Canada, they have not they don't have stable internet, for example. So we, as educators, as instructors, we really need to think about how to accommodate or how to really think about what we can do to, to help people from racialized minority. For example, I talked to many of my students during the pandemic, and then one of my students, for example, told me that she lived with her parents in the same room. So when she, Joy in the room, she cannot talk because when because there are a lot a lot of people around in the same room, right? So it's crowded space, and then she can only do the homework or watch the video the the, the videos when their parents asleep in the middle of night after midnight, right? So those kind of experience we need to take into consideration. Thinking about how and then for example in the city. There's segregation, there's in terms of quality of school, neighborhood segregation lead to educational segregation. And that could create longstanding racial inequalities. And then also systemic, when we think about systemic racism, let's hear some, some data. For example, in Toronto, half of the students got expelled from the school were black but only 10% were white students. Half, like why? Young children, half of them 
were expelled as black students, only 10%, right? Why there's a 40% points gap, right? And then also black students in Toronto were three times more likely to be suspended. Right? So think about the, the data, the gap, right? Especially children, right? Not adults. Maybe it's a different story, but think about children in school. Why? What did they deserve to have those higher, much, much higher odds to got suspended, for example? And then I want to share this video thinking about the differences between explicit and implicit uh, racism. Moon study at the Yale Child Study Center. But I had to read a few times just to believe what it was telling me. The researchers recruited about 135 preschool teachers. They had them watch video footage of four kids playing a black boy, a black girl, a white boy, and a white girl. And they told the teachers, their subjects, watch the video. There may be some challenging behaviors. As soon as you see something that could become challenging, hit the enter key on your keypad. And here's the trick there was no challenging behavior. The researchers were using eye scan technology to see which child the teachers were looking at the most. And what they found is that the teachers, both white and black alike, spent the most time watching the black boy, waiting for bad behavior that never came. There's one more really interesting headline in the study, which comes later. The teachers were also given a one paragraph description to read a hypothetical child with a stereotypical name who behaves pretty badly in class, pushes, scratches, throws toys. And some of the teachers were also given some biographical information that helped make sense of that behavior. They were told that the child lives with his mother, a father has been in and out for years, they're relatively poor, the mother is depressed, works three jobs. Researchers want to know if knowing this information, made the teachers more empathetic to the kid. Well, here's the shot. It, it did, but only if the teacher and the child were the same race. If the teacher and the child, a white teacher and a black child, or even a black teacher and a white child, knowing that biographical information, those teachers were less empathetic towards those students. And here's why this matters. Imagine if this is true, if there's this empathy deficit in preschool. Well, imagine where else that's true. So really think about those, what we call implicit bias against racialized students in school, right? is sometimes we, as teachers, we are unaware we have those kind of like subtle behaviors that could lead to racism, discrimination. And the second thing I wanna talk about is that curriculum, thinking about what we can do in school. Asian Canadian history is rarely taught in school, right? But Asian Canadian history is Canadian history, right? So only very recently, people, educators, started talking about how to include Asian Canadian history, Asian immigrants' experience in school curriculum, right? So in the United States too, this just happened a few months ago, that only two states, like making the teaching of Asian American history in public school mandatory, only two states. So think about how teaching Asian Canadian history, Asian American history can help. So those are some direct qualitative quotes from people. Right? So for example, when you have a curriculum that is familiarity, that kind of sense of familiarity about Asian cultural, Asian Canadian history, it reduced assumptions and uh, discrimination, right? So that matters in terms of education, in terms of socialization. Those are direct quotes from Asian Americans and Asian 
Canadians. Those, those kind of education is affirming our sense of belonging to this country and also that we deserve to feel safe. And then third thing is celebration, right? Celebrate Asian culture, Asian Canadians. So let's think about, when we think about Canadians, 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 what faces in your mind? Canadians, what kind of face, faces in your mind? Do you see those faces? You imagine those Canadians? Or do you, many of you may not even recognize some of those are Canadians, right? Asian Canadians. So this is a study from American Political Science Review demonstrate that exposure to, for example, cultural or celebrities will help reduce discrimination, racial bias, right? So that's the importance of, for example, celebrating Asian cultural, Asian Canadian history here in Canada, in school from early on, and that will help reduce bias and then discrimination. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about like what we can do, like most specifically as professors, as teachers, as educators, what opportunities we have. One is that to better connect over students to outside world, right? Thinking about the, 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 the virtual schooling, make it possible for us to teach students about people from other countries, food, culture from other places and experience from other people, people's experience from other places, right? So that can help us thinking about others' cultures and then reduce those assumptions and the racial bias. So for example, the United Nations, they have those international virtual schooling. They have programs trying to bring people together from places from different places together in school, in the classroom. And also think about how to learn Asian history, Asian culture through, for example, the virtual reality thing that we can um, help students or explore online museum, Asian cultures, Asian stories, right? So that's, that's a lot, a lot of opportunities and it can be done fairly easily through online new technologies and from media, social media, Instagram, and then um, students, they like, they spend so much time on, on, on those social media. And then we as educators can help or direct those, uh, socialize the, them with those kind of like uh, information and knowledge. And then also thinking about encourage students to speak out on anti-Asian violence, right? Help them to write story and then help them to even to, 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 to have those kind of like talk to each other across racial groups. Those could help young students really thinking about, what, for example, what is anti-Asian racism? What is racism? And how Asians experience discrimination, racism in different ways to different levels, right? And then there's lots, lots of online uh, materials we can use and then ways that we can help students to learn more about um, Asian culture and cre create connections. For example, we can think about create digital pen pals between students in Canada and students from, from other places, right? So then encourage connection, promote um, mature understanding and then resources, a lot, a lot of re resources, tools online that we can use. And then be considerate thinking about how to choose those resources or materials for education purpose. Right? And then here is just a list of some website I think are very useful. And uh, hopefully I'll, we'll be able to share the those slides with you so you can um, Take a look. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wu. That was amazing. And I love 
how informative it was in terms of ideas and where we can go from here. So very informative, very much appreciated. Um, we wanna thank you for your amazing presentation, for unpacking anti-racism, anti-Asian racism specifically, for us in a very clear and dynamic way. You have provided us a lot of food for thought and best practice strategies through the use of educational technology to inspire and change both in the educational world and beyond. So what we are going to do now is I'm just going to introduce uh, everybody to the call to action challenge that is coming up after this, as well as our speakers for the next session. And then I think we'll open it up. People have been posting phenomenal questions on Slido. And um, if everyone still has any questions, you can post on there or you can raise your hand afterwards. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to share my screen if that works. But again, thank you so much. That was incredible. And if you'll just bear with me for one second, as I pull it up, that will be fabulous. There we go. Okay, so as we explained at the beginning of the session, there is something that is going to extend beyond just the simple presentation, and it was by no means simple, but we really want you to take Dr. Wu's words and extend this beyond what you saw here today. So as mentioned prior, we're looking for little acts of change. What can be small, what can be large? And really taking your intention from the speaker series and eradicating racism through small and large steps. So as such, we've created this call to action to move the teaching of Dr. Wu forward. Now we challenge every one of you as attendees of today's presentation to participate in one act of change. So this could ha be having a conversation with your neighbor or a colleague about something that resonated with you from today's session. It could be creating an anti-racism interactive activity for your staff, for your colleagues, for peers, for an audience. You might create a subset presentation or a podcast reacting to what was um, presented here today. So he has done an amazing job and continues to do an amazing job at anti-Asian racism, addressing these challenges, addressing these issues, especially in the form of when COVID has happened and mental health. And we really want to be able to move this forward. So at the bottom of the screen here, you will see that we have a hashtag and we encourage everybody to use this hashtag. It's uh, hashtag UBC met anti-racism to start that conversation and keep it moving forward. And this is available here. You can do through Twitter, it will be available on our site so that everybody will have the chance to be able to explain and share their ideas of how you're taking these words and these teachings and moving it forward towards change. Now, when it comes to the availability of impactful, culturally sensitive and relevant lesson plans that address anti-racism and specifically anti-Asian racism, there are very limited resources that are out there. So we are urging you as a grand gesture for any interested attendees of today's session to submit a lesson plan that aligns with the content from Dr. Wu's presentation and your curriculum in an attempt to create good quality anti-Asian resources to put in the hands of our educators. Now this lesson plan call to action can be found on the MET website where you will see here, oh, my apologies, on the call to action. And here you will find um, it's linked to the lesson plan template. It's linked to the criteria and the submission. And all lesson plans are due by Friday, February 25th. Um, by 11.59 p.m. in Pacific Standard Time for review. Some of the lesson plans will be chosen to be published on the web, or MET website and may receive a grant offered by Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center to create additional digital resources which so, will support your lesson plan. All lesson plan entries, they can include grades K to 12 and graduate studies and all are encouraged and welcome. And as quoted by Nelson Mandela, education is the power weapon or powerful weapon, which you can use to change the world. So we are asking you to help with this change. No act is too small.
And moving forward, we do, we are continuing our speaker series throughout uh, the next few months. So within that, our next form in late February will be a podcast. It will be available through the MET website towards the end of February and will address pervasive racism and the S2 LGBTQ plus community. And we welcome Mir Dabar, Associate Faculty of the City of University of Seattle in BC and founder of Queer BIPOC Association, as well as Alec De, or Alex DeForge, who is the coordinator of social impact and provincial services at Community and where they specialize in S2 and anti-racism. And then on March 8th, or 28th from four to five o'clock PM um, Pacific Standard Time, we welcome the world-renowned Dr. Carl James to speak on the topic of anti-Black racism in a presentation named Race Matters, the Social Schooling and Educational Experience of Black Youth, which strives to disseminate Black racism through educational technology. Now, registration for this event is now open. We will post the URL in um, the chat area, and you can also access this through the MET website using that. So at this time, we would like to move over to a Q&A session, um, and throughout the presentation, you were asked to post your questions, and I will be covering those questions that were in Slido, and Dr. Samia Khan will be covering the questions based on those who raised their hands. So again, Dr. Wu, thank you so much. I know there are phenomenal questions that were asked, and you know when there are good questions, it means it was a good presentation. So I will stop sharing my screen right now, and I will go over. Okay, the first question that was asked is, um, how do we get the white majority to recognize anti-racism matters when some of them may feel disadvantaged by equity and inclusion efforts? And what I can do is I can post this so that you can actually read it um, in the chat area and I'll post it for everybody to see. So again, how do we get the white majority to recognize anti-racism matters when some of them may feel disadvantaged by equity and inclusion efforts? That's a very, very uh, good question, right? So when we sociologically, when we think about why this anti-racism or this, uh, why this uh, discrimination, why this, like, for example, anti-immigrants, it's because of those, what we call that interest conflict theory thinking about people feel threat, people thinking about like those threat from immigrants, from racialized minorities, from like white, for example, from perspective, white people's perspective, the, the feeling of threat lead to those uh, anti-immigrants, anti-Asian racism even, thinking about the pandemic, right? We here, we blame like Chinese, they are importing those, like we feeding threat and we blaming Right? Even though we still not have no answer for, well, for example, the uh, origin of the virus and all that, but we are blaming because of feeding threat, we will call that conflict theory, right? But how to really address, and then it's back to the education, right? It's really difficult thinking about um, to, racism is a longstanding issue and we have to start from school, right? Because my based on my research about social relationship about people's views toward others and those kind of views are often stabilized early in life like after age 16 it's difficult to do things about that it's difficult to change their opinions of the racial racial bias toward others and in those kind of like um, racism views right so it has to be done in school through education so that's why we are here today, actually, like we, we should educate our children um, thinking about that cur curriculum, for example, talking about um, people, ra racialized people's experience, and then thinking about that they are also part of the country, part of the history. This is their home, right? So then lead to like, there's no us and you people like kind of talking from school but now we still have this like you people so then that is categorizing 
right? Categorize, grouping others. We race, we racialize people into different groups, right? Based on their how they look, based on their background. And that lead to like competing theory that I'm competing you because you are Chinese. I'm competing with you because you are um, racialized minorities, right? So that's the real issues here is that the competing is built based on the categorization of peoples and putting people in different categories. And then for a racialized minority like Henry, Dr. Henry, you said, we have no control over who we are here, right? We are labeled as like minorities, right? So you are minorities. So like maybe you did whatever you do, you're not deserving what you, you have, right? So, so that kind of thinking is not right. And it has to be changed, adjust through education from early on for over children, future. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. The next question, there are some really great questions here. The next one, how do we address racism per, or perpetuated by and towards each other and other BIPOC, or BIPOC within Asian Canadian communities? And I've posted that question in the chat area as well. This is also a very, very good question. And thinking about racism, like all forms of racism, anti-Asian, anti-Black, it's just not like it's not about actually we we also need to think about it's not just always about for example white and racialized minorities also happen like in explicit and implicitly those buyers within asian groups within for example black and asians asians blacks right so all people even asians they have those in implicit buyers or, or explicit buyers toward uh toward other people from different categories, from different racial groups, right? So um, the importance again, right, is, is the categorization is place people, group people into different categories is, is a major cause for uh, all those uh, discrimination, all forms of discrimination. So we need to be really think about how not to thinking about categorize people based on how they look, where they come from, right? Thank you. The next question is in the chat area, deals with technology. How is this racism manifested in or mediated by technology, the technosphere, in ways that are different from other social spheres? Yeah, so all those technologies, all those like, for example, Google, all those like the searching, like they, 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 they are all racism, they're buyers, right? So they lot a lot of talking like uh, now, nowadays, thinking about how technology, how uh, media, how all those can be buyers, can be racism as well, right? So from, from, for example, the lot of study, when we search about Chinese or Asian women, they, a lot of, uh, a lot of pictures coming up as prostitute, right? So that's the Google kind of like buyers toward like portray or like describing Asian women as prostitute, sex workers, right? So that from the Google, so those kind of buyers, it's very difficult to be addressed, right? So because they're subtle, hidden, right? It's technology, it's hidden and the public are less aware of those kind of like hidden subtle buyers technology and but then over time people are socialized by those technology and the last was a one reason that why this widespread racism going on is because people are socialized by those technologies by those tools we use and they're subtle and very difficult to for people to realize that those kind of like uh, tools we use technology could be racially buyers and then discriminated against people. Thank you so much. I didn't realize that anti-Asian racism is so widespread with the Asian population being one in every five individuals. Why do we not see more inclusion in curriculums? That's a very good question. Right? We are not talking. So that's in Canada, we are not talking about like uh, anti-Asian racism at all, even like before the pandemic or the other forms of racism that often, like I, I mentioned that even the uh, anti-racism -raci strategy, the Canadian government anti-racism strategy did not even mention about anti-Asian violence 
anti-Asian racism at all last year, right? Uh, after this year, they added the terminology, those new content about anti-Asian violence. Uh, they just recently added, right? So we are not talking about, we are denying the existence of anti-Asian racism. Um, so that's also a, 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 a reason why this um, anti-Asian anti racism, and I'm not realize that how widespread it can be, right? One, a 20% of Canadian populations, Asian Canadians, right? So relatively in the United States, only 6% of US population. So it's bigger problem here than in the United States, right? So, but we, we, we don't talk much relatively compared to the US, right? When US, New York Times, CNN talking about those, maybe we start talking because we follow American politics, American news more often. But um, it's here, it's, it's, it's our problem, it's Canadian problem. And we have much bigger uh, Asian population. Especially in 10 years, there will be much, much greater um, Asian population here in the Canada, in Canada, also in the United States, because Asian uh, population is the fat, fast, fastest growth population in North America. Which speaks to the importance of resources and the need for anti Asian um, resources and the call for action. So, thank you. Um, our next one is in the chat. You talked about the distinction between racism being experienced or directed. Is experienced by not more inclusive? Not everything is directed, but is still racist. Yeah, so that's why we cannot simply understand racism as an experience of racialized people, right? We should not understand racism as an experience, just an experience of um, minority people, for example, or racialized uh, people. We have to think about the cause, not the effect, right? Well, what are the causes of those kind of racism and those kind of experience, right? right? So racism is not experience, but the cause, like who, what, le leading to those kind of experience. Thank you. I forgot to mute myself. All right. Dr. Khan, did you want to do any of these? I feel bad taking on all of the questions. Certainly I can. Um, so the next question is, where does meritocracy fit in the anti-racism conversation if systemic racism perpetuates inequity? Society is not meritocratic. And I will put it in the chat. Yeah, so that's uh, like a, a big issue when we think about uh, like uh, all those hiring and all those like opportunity kind of like uh, thing when we think about um, diversity, inclusion, those kind of uh, how to address, how to think about uh, quality and opportunities, right? So one thing I think is important to consider is understand like what is, for example, quality means to different people. Right? And then we'll also understand from the life course perspective, what people have to experience to achieve, for example, certain standard, certain quality, right? So for some people, for, let's just put it very simply, like for me, for example, I'm from very poor family. And then for some other people from very high standard or rich family, it's easier for people with a lot of support from rich family to achieve certain success much, much easier than people from like disadvantaged position from, for example, when we, we think about education segregation, neighborhood segregation, we need to think about children or people who are coming from this neighborhood than people who are coming in the disadvantaged neighborhood and how from like time perspective or life course perspective, what they have to experience or to work 
to achieve certain quality. So we really need to take that into consideration, thinking about like who we need to, um, like in hiring decision or in some other op opportunities. So, so that's the reason when we think about two different things, like inequalities and equities, equalities, two things. It's one is a parity, one, the other is equality, equality. Right? Inequality, disparity is a little different from equ equities, right? So the two different concepts. Say so equity, meaning that we need to really take into consideration people from different backgrounds and what they experience to achieve like certain standard. So that's one thing. Second, it's also important to think about the standard, how to measure the standard. Right, dimensions of the standard. Let's think about the IQ test. Right, we think about IQ test. It, we can, based on the IQ test, we can define who are smarter than others. But the IQ test itself is racially biased, right? Because people who design those tests, who design those questions, are probably have did not take into into account of different backgrounds and even different um, experience or, or even language issues, right? Or question, the, the way they ask question is like, maybe it was a, it's a Western way of asking question. So maybe the country, other countries, they answer those standard IQ tests poorly. So they are stupid or like they're not have that kind of uh, high IQ, right? So think about two things. One really is about the life course experience, what it takes for different people from different backgrounds to achieve certain quality, first thing. Second thing is the quality itself, the measure of quality. You need to think about the dimension, the multi-dimension of quality or how to capture, measure the quality, right? So IQ test is an example. IQ test maybe is good, but it could be racially biased toward or culturally biased, right? Uh, towards certain populations. So those, are very important to uh, to be considered when we think about really think about um, what is good, what is bad, or in hiring decision, all those like people create how to create opportunities for a diverse population. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wu. And um, we have a number of additional questions on the Slido, which I think I'll save for now. Um, for those of you that have uh, stuck with us for the entire presentation and the question and answer period, it's been wonderful. And maybe some of those questions Dr. Wu would answer um, and place uh, on our website if he would kindly do that because there are so many other interesting questions. And I just want to also um, leave it to the group. If you have an additional question, you may ask it now. I think a lot of people got their chance to ask questions through the Slido. Um, but if you don't have an additional question, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ewert uh, to express our sincere thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. Dr. Wu, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for your expertise, for your insights, for presenting some of your research. This has been enlightening to me and I know to many other people. And I very much look forward to this conversation continuing. Again, this conversation can continue at hashtag UBC met anti-racism and the call to action for lesson plans and any other activity ideas to be able to continue this conversation and be able to get those resources out to people um, so that they can start doing this great work in their own um, classrooms. So thank you again, Dr. Wu. Thank you to Edith Lando for their generous support and for everybody involved in putting this together today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you to our participants, our attendees. Um, for those who are still here, we very much appreciate your presence here today. And we wish you a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world, just have a good one.